Well, good morning again. And yes, my better half, the truer <laughs> half, the smart half of the McCoy clan is here to share today. And uh, we're going to share a message that Leanne has uh, pinned from her heart. And mm -hmm. I know you'll be blessed today. We're in the month of prayer, unburdened. And uh, we want to start with a quote from E.M. Bounds. If you haven't uh, read any of Bounds, B-O-U-N-D-S, E.M. Bounds, you need to read anything you can by E.M. Bounds. The life of the church is the highest life, and its office is to pray. Its prayer life is the highest life, the most fragrant, the most conspicuous. When God's house on earth is a house of prayer, then God's house in heaven is busy and powerful in its plans and movements. God shapes the world by prayer. The more praying there is in this world, the better the world will be, and the mightier the forces against evil anywhere. If the life of the church really is the highest life, and if its office is to pray, then God's house on earth ought to be a house of prayer. For when God's house on earth is the house of prayer, then God's house in heaven is busy and powerful in its plans and movements. We, we want, want Thompson, Thompson Station, Station Church to, to be a house, house of, of prayer. prayer. The title of today's message is unburdened by unleashing the power of prayer. In the next few minutes, Leanne and I are going to share three things. First, we're going to explain that God made the church an unstoppable force by giving us a common language in prayer. And then we're going to tell you how we intend to be more intentional in prayer here at Thompson Station Church. And then as we close, we're going to share how we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that prayer works. Online and on campus here at Central and those of you at here, let's pray together as we get into God's Word. Thank you today, Lord, for the power of worship. Thank you that you've filled the, the, the presence, you filled us with the presence of your Spirit. Now teach us through your Word. Thank you for this month of prayer. Thank you for Leanne and her, and her team that lead us annually in January month of prayer. So God, truly today, would we sense your presence? Would we learn from your word? Would we learn to be unburdened by the shackles and circumstances and situations of life as we connect deeper with you by and through prayer? Holy Spirit, guide, guard, direct Leanne and me as we teach today. We trust you, Holy Spirit, to fill us and speak through us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So prayer is our common language. What we're about to share with you came from one of over 40 books that my friend Jennifer Kennedy Dean wrote. I have a picture of us, I think, that we can show you of Jennifer and I at the Southern Baptist Convention in 2019. But as only God would know, it was just two days before she died. And so Jennifer is in heaven now, and what we have left are these great um, Bible studies that she's left behind. She was such an encourager and such an encourager personally to me, but then also in the world of prayer and especially in encouraging the church to pray. In one particular book, it was called Clothed with Power. She took the actual garments that the priest wore, and they are very specifically um, uh, described to us in the Old Testament, and she showed how every part of that priestly garb was pointing us toward Jesus. And in that book, she she makes this lesson that we're about to share with you. And here is what she writes. Jesus so passionately desires unity among his followers that it is a main thrust of one of his final prayers on earth. This was on his mind as he faced his crucifixion. The whole full spectrum plan of salvation for which he was about to die would not be finalized until it resulted in the miracle of a unified church. Ehud was his heart's cry to his father. Ehud, of course, it looks like Echad in the English, but in the Hebrew, it's Ehud. This word, this Hebrew word is translated unity in the English. But like many Hebrew words, it has a much richer and deeper meaning than just a one-word translation in English. It has a sense of compound unity, if you will, our oneness derived from multiple or several elements. When we say that we're of one heart, we're describing our compound unity. When we say that we lift our hearts and our hands in one voice in praise to God, we're describing Ehud. 
In John 17, Jesus prayed for us. And he prayed in John 17 that we, all of us, the followers of Christ, would have a oneness with God through him and through one another. Let me read the 22nd, 23rd verse of John 17. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as I am as you and I are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. If we keep reading in John 17, we'll discover the result of this unity, this Ehud. John 17, 23, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Our unity is in Christ. It is powerful. It is an unstoppable force. It is the best testimony the world can see in us is our one heartness, our unity. Hmm. This unity that we share is actually the expression of the spirit of the living God living in you and then the same spirit living in me who is active and alive. And then when you and I get together, what brings us this oneness, this connection, this we kind of get each other is the spirit of the living God who lives in both of us. And Jennifer wrote this, unity is such a powerful force that it could only be entrusted trusted to a spirit-filled church. In the wrong hands, the power of unity would be disastrous. Unity, even the kind that is nothing but flesh, is potent. And if you'll turn to, in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9, you'll see that God intervened because he saw what mankind would do with the power of unity. Do you remember the Tower of Babel? Let's read Genesis 9, the first verses, and talk about the Tower of Babel for That's a 11. moment. Genesis 11. Oh, Genesis 11. Thank <laughs> you, dear. That. We have spent the last 35 years together, and you are good at correcting me. Right, thank right. you, honey. I'm usually, I don't get to say it out loud, though. <laughs> now you can correct me in front of everybody. Right. Normally, it's just from home. I All right. I'll tell you later. <laughs> that, that'll happen multiple times today. Genesis, Genesis 11, 11, verse 1 to 9. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. And the Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of the whole world. And from there, the Lord scattered them all over the face of the whole earth. According to these verses, what unified the whole world? It was a common language. Everyone spoke the same language. And what motivated these people to build this city and this tower? They want to make a name for themselves. They were driven to exalt themselves. Mm. And what was the Lord's evaluation of this situation? Well, he said, if as one people speak in the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Do you see the power of unity? Mm. Nothing will be impossible, even when that is unity in the flesh. Mm -hmm. To keep things from getting out of hand, what did God do? So he just came down and confused their language. He disunified, I don't know that that's a word, but we're using it, <laughs> disunified us. He created a complication. He segregated us in our languages, but he, he put a monkey wrench in our unity, thus subduing our evil intent, our motive to elevate ourselves. Even today, we struggle with disunity and confusion caused by what we call a language barrier. So at the Tower of Babel, God disunified mankind so that we would be limited in what we would be able to accomplish apart from him. But compare this then to what God did on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, verses 1 through 12. Let's read together as I read aloud Acts 2, verse 1. There about 
Genesis, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Fifth, chapter, fifth book of the New Testament, Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these men speaking Galileans? Aren't they all Galileans who are speaking? Then how is it that each of them speaks and we hear them in our native language? Now it gets fun. Yes. <laughs> she was glad I had to read these. Look at these. Parthenians and Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and parts of Libya and near Cyrene, visitors of Rome. I made it. You did good. <laughs> Cretans and Arabs. And we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Hmm. The scripture records that there were Jews from every nation all over the world gathered in Jerusalem that day. And what did God do? God reversed what he did at the Tower of Babel. In Genesis 11, God confused the people and scattered them, divided them so they couldn't make a name for themselves. But then at Acts 2, at Pentecost, God undid what he did in Genesis 11. When God sent the Holy Spirit to us in Acts 2, and he sent it to the church, he gave them the gift of a common language so that the people who had gathered in Jerusalem from all over the world, they heard their own language being spoken. And then the miracle, though, was bigger than words. For when the disciples opened their mouths and they began to tell the people about Jesus, the words that they said actually penetrated the hearts of the hearers. Of course, those that were gathered together loved hearing the words in their own language, like they could actually understand the words, but they were hearing more than just the words. Their hearts were hearing the message. That's right. And if you've ever tried to convince someone of truth, and you've ever tried try to just um, use words that are good enough, you know, for them to understand what you're saying. You know how remarkable it is when finally, like, you get through to them and they're like, oh, I get it. I understand what you're saying. This was what happened at Pentecost. Mm -hmm. When the disciples spoke in tongues that they didn't even natively know of their own because God gave them the gift to be able to speak the language, it was more than just the consonants and the verb tenses and the, and the nuances of that culture. It was hearing truth that was penetrating the hearts of those that were listening. Mm. And so the disciples were given this gift of a common language, the kind that knits our hearts and our minds as one. Through Jesus' death and then his resurrection, God bridged the gap between us and him. Now we can understand one another because Jesus closed the gap between us and God. We can hear God's voice. We can know what he is speaking to us. Mm. And not only can we hear him and understand what he's saying to us, but we can hear and understand each other. And so that makes our work more effective, way more effective. If at the Tower of Babel, God took away common language and then gave this gift back to the church at Pentecost, what is the result? What is the result of such a gift? Nothing will, will be, be impossible, impossible for, for us, us, the church. Jennifer concluded her teaching about this power of unity and our common language by saying this. When God released his spirit onto the earth, one of the manifestations was that a diverse group of people were merged into a powerful force now called the church. The power of unity is such that God held it in reserve for his spirit-enabled body. And so as the church, it is our divine privilege to experience unity with God and with one another through this common language of prayer. I hope that this discussion excites you we are, we are the church of the living God, a powerful force that cannot be defeated. Prayer is our common language. 
And when we are united in the common language, this common language of prayer, nothing will be impossible for us. Now that you know how God returned the power of unity through prayer when he established the church, let, let us share with you how we're going to be a house of prayer at Thompson Station Church this year. First... If you don't know how to pray, don't worry about that. We're going to continue to help you to learn to pray. We're all learning to pray. We're on a journey together, more and more understanding that prayer is a heartfelt communication with God. So Leanne offers Teach My Heart to Pray on a regular basis, January and August. You'll hear more messages like this one. Uh, tune in on Wednesdays. All of you are invited. Facebook Live, our Thompson Station Facebook Live or on the website. We have, we have prayer and praise every Wednesday at noon. That is our corporate prayer time as a church. Now, what might happen, friends, if those of you online, those of you at Hillcrest, those of you at Central, if all of us who were, were here gathering on Sunday mornings, what would happen if all of us gathered in prayer? on a Wednesday at noon, and we cried out to God in one heart that ehud unity. What would God do? Any disunity that social media does and any disunity that we find on Facebook or Instagram or any other kind of social, uh, social media, guess what? When we pray, God will bring unity to us. Such a powerful opportunity. Please join us. Hmm. Just think about it. If the disciples had not been gathered together and praying that day that God licked their heads with flames, <laughs> they would have never experienced this gift of a common language. There's nothing more powerful than the church getting together to pray. And we will, throughout this year, periodically have gatherings like our night of worship that's coming up next Sunday night, where we're coming together, all of us who've been fasting, and even if you haven't been fasting, coming together just for the purpose of worshiping in and celebrating this unity God gives us so that we can pray and worship God. Um, is that still me? Yep, that's you, honey. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> The Prayer Clinic is an intercessory prayer ministry intent on meeting the needs of anyone who comes, bringing you, and what we do, I don't know if you always, if you really understand what we do, but if you have any kind of need in your life that you're inviting God to um, connect to that need, and you don't maybe even know how to pray, or you just need the power of having <clears throat> other believers praying with you, then when you come to the Prayer Clinic, we have people there who are trained to pray God's powerful word mm -hmm. into whatever circumstances are going on in your life. And we come, what's so beautiful about it is this unity of coming together is that you're praying with people who know that God hears and answers us when we pray. And so all of our prayers are answered in the prayer clinic. Now, not all of them are answered exactly the way that we wanted them to be answered, but our mission is is to take the very real needs that we have to, and bring them into God's divine purposes and then to be able to understand how God is speaking and purposing and releasing his divine purposes in our lives in response to us praying. Psalm 37, 23 is a foundational promise for the prayer clinic. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. Mm. He delights in every detail of their lives. That's right. And so the prayer clinic not only meets people where they are, using whatever's going on in their lives to draw them to the Lord, but the prayer clinic also builds the faith of the church. That's right. If you don't have one, I hope you'll mm. stop by the prayer clinic and get your God's Got yeah. This bracelet because... You say, what is this? Well, this is whatever is troubling you, whatever ails you. God's got that. God's mm. got this. Because we're tracking our prayers that we pray in the prayer clinic that are both given in person and also online, you can go to our, our website. You go to our app. It's even better, Thompson Station, and you can request prayer there. We're tracking them. We're able to celebrate when God answers our prayer. Just this year, we've seen God grow families through adoption, heal people of all kinds of illnesses and injuries, He's delivered justice in the courts, provided new jobs, and restored relationships just in this last year. The prayer clinic is our personal spiritual laboratory where we watch and see how God responds when his children, his church, pray. And we want to draw this to a close by saying to, to you all, to us, the church, 
prayer works. Mm. We're say, we have a saying here at Thompson Station that when we work, we work, but when we pray, God works. Prayer reminds us that we are desperately dependent on the Spirit of God to do the work that He wants to do in us and through us. And the truth is, we're pretty clever and we can do a lot of things on our own. But those things are what Jesus calls nothing if we're not abiding with Him in prayer. In John 15, verse 5, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus said that when we abide in him, we will bear much fruit. And just in case we needed help understanding that the abiding part is the absolutely necessary part, he went on to say that whatever it is we're producing when we're not abiding is (laughs) nothing. (laughs) Today, Jesus is saying to his church, Jesus is saying to us online, Hillcrest Central, this is what he's saying. I have given you the gift of a common language. I have paved the way for you to be connected with my Father. When our Father, which art in heaven, communicates with you, you will understand what he is saying. You have been given the ability to know the truth, to abide in the truth, and to experience the reality of truth in fellowship with one another by his word and by his spirit. When we pray, we participate in this miraculous flow of heaven's power into earth's desperate need, whatever that need may be in your lives. And as we reflected, Leanne and I, we reflected this week in preparation, almost 33 years of ministry, January will be 33 years that we've been with Thompson Station. We thought of these major ways that God, and these are just the very few ways that God has answered us when we prayed. In the fall of 1988, we came here in January of 89. In the fall of 88, Leanne and I knelt beside our bed in an apartment that was part of the seminary housing at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. And the two of us knelt and held hands and we cried before God and we said, where do you want us to go? Now, between the two of us at that time, we had seven diplomas. (laughs) We had seven degrees, and we were ready to leave the world of full-time schooling and go into the world of full-time ministry. Now, imagine our excitement when God called us to Thompson Station, and he trusted us. And when we arrived, we had eight people. That's one more than the degrees that we had. (laughs) And under 600 mailing addresses when we got here. But we do have the number one bulk mailing. Yes, we do. We've got the. Station. If you go over there to the Thompson Station Post Office and you ever get a bulk mail from us, we have the first permit. Number when one. I went to the post office and asked for bulk mail, because we both worked at a mega church in Fort Worth and did a lot of bulk mail in that day, that's before social media. <laughs> when I asked, the postmistress didn't know about bulk mailing. She had to go to Franklin to learn how to do bulk mailing. <laughs> we got number one so permit. So we still have probably the number one permit permit. And on that first Sunday as Thompson Station Church, we gathered in what's now the community center that sits right next to Circa in downtown Thompson Station. Mm-hmm. If you haven't been there, you can run over there and check it out. Station. And on that day, Tom was preaching to a vast crowd of high attendance for us of 21 people. Now that included my parents, his mom, some people from our mother churches, and, and we were gathered together in that room. And on that day, Tom boldly proclaimed at his fresh out of seminary eagerness that within a year there would be a hundred people in that room and we would be, be this church that they'd been wanting to establish for a long time. Well, all eight of our members that very next week called us on the phone so to talk to Tom and say, hey, that's a pretty lofty goal. I just don't want you to get discouraged if that doesn't happen within a year. But one year on the anniversary of our starting at Thompson Station, it's the very last Sunday of January every year. There were 113 people that were in that room that day. And so I got to thinking as we were talking about this and how prayer, we pray for things that are not yet, things that only we see in our hearts and our minds because maybe God's planted it there in us. And then we watch and God brings it to fruition. All 113 of those people were an answer to prayer, but so are all of you. Like everybody who's ever been since then is an answer 
her to that vision, that heart, that pleasure of God that he's brought about by this powerful unity he's given us. Absolutely. When Leanne and I got here, there was a broken down sign on this corner. This corner was property was purchased by our mother church before we got here, but it had been sitting there actually rotting down. So it didn't, and it said future home of Thompson Station Baptist Church. And it didn't look like they were doing anything. So I went out there and propped it up temporarily. And first thing I did was bought a new sign where we actually had some hope because it was like rotting down. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we went to work and we prayed and we worked and God brought a, a fruitful increase. And we moved on to this corner in the, the fall of 1990, we built our first building here uh, with volunteer labor. It cost us $122,000, and uh, that was about $20 a square foot, and uh, that's cheap even in that day. <laughs> so God blessed us. We used volunteer labor again, built in 93, 96, and 99. Every summer of those years, teams of people came from all over the southeast and parked their campers in our parking lot. And they just blessed us working in the heat to build facilities for you and those of you before to worship here. And all of us spoke the same common language of prayer. 2002, we built this worship center, the first building without volunteer laborers. And then in 2005, we added the South Wing. 2008, we added the C building. Today, we're refreshing our buildings. Thank you for your flexibility as we're doing some refreshing around here. We also purchased four houses that we used for a safe room to help kids in transition. We also have a missionary house and other things. So God has blessed us. These are all tangible proof that God hears and answers when we pray. And even besides the buildings themselves, we went into our neighborhoods and we knocked on doors and we sat in countless homes at, in living rooms and at kitchen tables sharing Jesus with the people in our community. And in 2004, we hosted prayer meetings all over the community. We called them cottage prayer meetings, I believe, because we had them in our cottages, in our little houses all over the place. And in September of 2004, an evangelist came in, preached messages right here in this auditorium and in a week's time we saw over 515 people make decisions for Christ I think we have a photo of that the awakening that's mm -hmm. those are that's probably youth night and several hundred youth made decisions for Christ and that's our evangelist six foot six 160 pounds out of Texas <laughs> um, if you want to read more about that just Google Awakening Thompson Station Church. I think it'll come up. There have been so many great moves of God through the years. We've witnessed him work in the lives of people over and over again. Just this past year, most of you were here when we were raising the funds to do our refreshing. Basically, in, a, in one day, through you and your generosity, God gave a million dollars plus to do this remodel. So we, we just see God working and working. Today, we had three baptisms. Our students, it's powerful. Last year, 2021, the highest number of baptisms in the history of Thompson Station Church during the second year of COVID. We just keep watching God work and work, and we celebrate. God's goodness and what he does as a result of us using the common language of prayer calling out to him our most recent answer to prayer is that this week we called a brand new new adult pastor that'll start with us February 13th we're excited to have a new adult pastor coming and uh, you'll be meeting him in the coming days God answers when we pray mm. Here's how we want to end our time together. We just, we just want you to pray. Whatever burdens you, whatever hurts you, whatever is heavy on you, we want to do what we've been talking about. And we're going to stand to our feet in just a moment, and we're going to have some music, and we just want to invite you to just, just lay whatever's on you onto him. In Matthew 11, he, Jesus says, Come to me, you who are heavy laden, who are burdened and weighed down, we don't need to live a daily life weighed down. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to him. And so I'm just simply going to ask us for just a minute or two just to take some time to just say, God, this is heavy on me, and I give it to you. Is it a, is it a family issue, a marriage issue, a finance issue, an emotional or mental issue? Is it a, a spiritual heaviness, a spiritual warfare? Or if you've got kids that are wayward or straying, whatever's heavy on you, and then I just want to ask you a couple of questions. What, what do you want to trust God for in this year? Give that to him. 
How will you lead your family in prayer this year? Make a commitment to that. Will you pray with your spouse? Will you pray in your life group? How about your personal prayer time? What might happen in 2022 if you unburdened yourself in prayer? Mm -hmm.